Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to our December episode of Somos Hispanos. I'm Nina Haganis. For those of us here in Michigan, it's quite chilly. The colorful leaves have fallen and the dreary winter weather is arriving. So I thought we could grab our imaginary suitcases and pack our summer gear, take a journey down south to a warmer, more colorful place. Let's go to Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca is a state located in the south of Mexico, bordering the states of Puebla, Veracruz, Chiapas, and Guerrero. The state of Oaxaca is most known for its indigenous peoples and cultures. Benito Juarez was a Mexican liberal politician and lawyer who served as the 26th president of Mexico. He was a Zapotec living here in Oaxaca. Benito Juarez was the first indigenous president of Mexico and the first indigenous head of state in the post-colonial Americas. He would not only be a source of inspiration in the world of politics and historical research, but an inspiration for diverse artists for more than a century. His greatest accomplishments were stopping the French from invading Mexico, reforming the Constitution, and modernizing the country. The name Oaxaca comes from the indigenous language of the Aztecs known as Nahuatl. It was originally pronounced Oaxayacac, which referred to the tree called Aguaje, which is still found in the capital city today. As Spaniards conquered the region, the word was transliterated to a more common Spanish pronunciation known as Oaxaca. Let's visit one of the prehistoric and pre-Hispanic treasures of Oaxaca known as Monte Alban. This land was originally inhabited by the Zapotecs in 500 BC and would be one of the most notable dominions in history. Monte Alban was not only the Zapotec nation's capital city, but at its height was home to nearly 25,000 people. Between 700 and 1300 AD, other dominions would start to grow and evolve up until the Spanish conquest in 1521. However, a city-state like Monte Alban with its vast number of residents, palaces, temples, markets, military fortresses, and even ball courts would never rise to this level again. In fact, many other villages of this era would grow to have no more than 3,000 inhabitants. What's truly unique about Monte Alban is its architecture. The main plaza is 300 meters by 150 meters, which is about the size of three football fields. And it was intended to hold the entire population of the city during their rituals and ceremonies. It's enclosed to the north and the south, with its large platforms only accessible by the monumental staircases. On its eastern and western sides, the plaza is also bounded by several smaller platform mounds on which stood temples and elite residences, as well as one of two ball courts known to have existed at the site. One of the well-known characteristics of Monte Alban are the carved stone monuments called danzantes, literally translating to dancers. The 19th century notion 
that these carvings were representative of dancers is now discredited. And it's now understood that these carvings are actually depicting people from the Olmec culture and potentially leaders from competing villages that were captured, tortured, and sacrificed. Over 300 Dansante stones have been recorded to date. Next, we travel to the colorful streets of Oaxaca. Here, art and color are one of the state's most distinguished characteristics. Everywhere you visit, we see beautifully painted buildings, decorations, art, and pottery. Oaxacan handcrafts are a specialty of this community. We see embroidery in vibrant colors, animal figurines in car from carved wood and hand painted. I'm getting hungry, how about you? Let's check out the traditional foods. Oaxaca is a major gastrohistoric center known internationally for its cuisine. Foods like Oaxacan cheese, mole, grasshoppers, chocolate, tlayudas, tamales, and mezcal are praised and promoted by food experts around the world. Here are only a few varieties of mole that are made here in Oaxaca. In all, there are seven notable varieties of this sauce. It's typically served with chicken, turkey, or pork. Each mole is comprised of 20 to 40 ingredients. These ingredients typically comprising of a variety of chiles, garlic, tomatoes, nuts, and many, many spices are traditionally hand grown on a metate or a stone like this one. Today, of course, some people will use the help of blenders and food mills to grind all of the ingredients. Once all of the ingredients are ground, they're toasted, fried, and made into the sauce and slowly simmer for hours. Here, we see my son learning how to make tortillas using blue corn and yellow corn. Grasshoppers, or chapulines, worms, and ants are another delicacy here in Oaxaca. I'll be honest, you wouldn't catch me eating these under any normal circumstances. But as they say, when in Oaxaca... That one was super crunchy. It doesn't really have a flavor, it's just mostly the crunch. It really has no taste. I'm very surprised. No taste. It's just you got to get over the, the fact that it's an ant. They were truly fantastic. I honestly can't get enough of them. Let's wash those grasshoppers down with a little mezcal. Mezcal is a distilled beverage that is made from agave. The word comes from that Aztec language, Nahuatl, which was mezcali. It meant oven cooked agave. The agave is cooked for three days and that mash is allowed to ferment in barrels for anywhere from one month to as long as 12 years. 
Miskal is truly an art form here in Oaxaca, and each production house takes great pride in their masterpiece. When served, mezcal is drunk straight, oftentimes accompanied by sliced oranges and sal de gusano, or worm salt. It's exactly what it says, salt with crushed worms. Sometimes mezcal is made into craft cocktails. Now that we're feeling full and tingly, Let's go dancing. Walking down the street, we can hear live marimba music. Marimba is a percussion instrument comparable to a xylophone. The marimba has a warmer, deeper, more resonant tone and more pure sound. Marimba music is what you typically hear in the town square during the evenings. Here, everyone gathers and dances what's called danzón. Originally from Cuba, danzón is now quite popular and active dance style here in Mexico. As you can see, it's a slow, formal partner dance. There's footwork that's set around syncopated beats and elegant pauses as the couples listen to the impressive instrumental packaging. As the couples stand and listen to the impressive instrumental passages, let's watch and listen. Just as we thought the evening was wrapping up, we experienced our very first calenda. A calenda is a pretty unique and quite remarkable parade that brings the entire community together with laughter, joy, and, and music. Here, the calendas are a fundamental part of the festivities. These calendas are made of giant paper mache puppets with arms that move around in any direction representing a dance. We were fortunate enough to watch it front row. Calenda processions not only take place on a weekly basis on Wednesday evenings as part of a Oaxacan tradition, but also in special ceremonies like weddings. You'll commonly see the bride and the groom followed closely by women with beautiful dresses carrying flowers on their heads and following closely in celebration with the calendas.
I hope you enjoyed our virtual visit to Oaxaca. And if you ever have the opportunity to visit in person, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful, spiritual, artful, and cultural experience. I can't wait to go back. Now, let's take a look at a segment we previously aired featuring John Valadez, a director and cinematographer who created the documentary American Exile. We've had some great response, and we wanted to keep the conversation around the deportation of military veterans going. So let's watch. I'm John Valadez. I'm a uh, professor at Michigan State University, where I'm the director of the documentary film program there. Um, I'm a uh, Chicano from Seattle, Washington, come from a family of migrant farm workers. My role with American Exile was that I'm the writer, director, producer, and researcher. I, you know, came up with the idea. I worked with Manuel and Valente and found all the stories that are in the film. What is the story of American Exile? Well, on one level, it's about two brothers who volunteered and fought in Vietnam and then some 50 years later uh, received notices of deportation. Well, then soon discovered that there were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of other veterans who were also being deported. Um, and so they set out to try to do something about that, to try to change national policy and stop the deportation of U.S. military veterans. On another level, I think the film really asks some fundamental questions. Uh, what does it mean to be American? Is that, is that a piece of paper? Um, is, it, uh, is, it, you know, is, it, is it a passport? What is that? Or does it mean something more? What, what, what is the role when we think about what it means to be American? What's the role of service and sacrifice? in the time of national crisis. Does that play into it at all? What about longevity in a place? What if you've spent your entire life in a country, in a community? What about family ties? What about kids, grandkids, grandparents? And when we say American, do many of us assume that whiteness is the baseline for what it means to be American? Do we have that as an unconscious assumption so that if you have an accent or a lilt in your voice or you have different color skin or a different religion or connections to a to a different land does that make you less american in some sense so so what is american and who decides and who benefits from that definition and who suffers and so so often we get defined um, as being foreign is not really being American. And so in that sense, the deporting uh, U.S. military veterans is part and parcel of an entire orientation towards a huge part of the American population, that is Latinos. But it also applies to Arab Americans, it applies to Asian Americans, ironically even to Native Americans, you know, who are indigenous to this land. In terms of deporting veterans, what's happened is that in the 1980s and 1990s, we had a huge influx of immigrants coming into the country, and it caused a lot of people to freak out. It was literally something of a crisis. Um, you can look back at news footage from the 80s and the 90s, and you can see uh, hundreds of people at a time crossing the border from you know, Juarez into El Paso, and it was clearly out of control. So in 1996, President Clinton passed an Immigration Reform Act, um, which really tightened the screws on immigrants, took away judges' discretion, and if you just messed up even just a little bit, boom, you could be on the docket for deportation. Now, ironically, they were, that legislation was so strict that if that were applied equally to American citizens, over 100 million Americans would be deported. One third of the American population would be deported. That's how strict it was. Very unfair.
no equality under the law in this case. When you deport a veteran, think about it. Uh, that person loses their VA benefits, you know, medical care. And so many of these veterans, not all, but many of them have seen combat in one way or another. Uh, they come home with post-traumatic stress. Or in Valente's case, he's 100% disabled because of PTSD. Valente was shot in the stomach. He also had his teeth knocked out because he ran into a Viet Cong booby trap. He's missing his front teeth. You know, these are uh, traumas that are hard to measure. And oftentimes you can't even see them. Um, and so when people are denied their veterans' benefits, it's like we've taken people and we have broken them spiritually, mentally. And then think of their families. Think of, 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 of families that are torn apart, who may not have a dad or an uncle or a grandfather anymore. Um, and it's not only economics, but it's also what that does to the family spiritually. How it makes them feel about themselves, that, that, their, that their relative or their dad or whatever it is is deported. It's an awful feeling. It makes you feel as though you are an American citizen in name only. So there are all kinds of ramifications um, that also echo throughout history um, and affect all of us. Not only those who are deported, but uh, those who do the deporting because now they become you know, part of a system that's unjust and unfair and inhumane and, and just gets history wrong. It's a long process to try to bring truth to that darkness. And, and, and that's what I hope that we do with, uh, in, you know, in making films. You know, when it, when it, whenever you make a film, I think it's important that there need to be multiple layers. Okay, right? So on one level, it's a story of a couple of guys who are in a personal crisis. They're fighting for something. They don't want to be deported. They want to stay. They want to be with their families. So the stakes are high for them personally. And I know that the narrative is going to be, by the end of the film, either they're going to get deported or they're going to be victorious. Either way is going to be pretty interesting. Okay? But there's more to it because what's happening to them is happening to thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of veterans. So it involves other people. And what's happening to those thousands or tens of thousands of veterans is also something that is affecting millions of other people, although they're not veterans. And all of that is a metaphor for the changes that we're going through as a country as we try to grapple with what it means to be American, who belongs, who's a foreigner, who has a true claim to being here. And those are the really rich questions. So if you can find a small story that's dramatic and interesting, but it's a metaphor for a larger phenomenon and says something existential about the human condition. How do we make democracy work? How do we see beyond the bounds of color, of race, of history, of trauma, of supremacy? How do we craft a new vision for who we are as a people? And in some ways, the veterans who go to war and fight for us and are willing to die for us are the canary in the coal mine. If they can be deported, if they can be treated this, this way, what does it say about for the rest of us? And what does it say for what we are becoming as a country that we're willing to betray our national heritage? Because as far as we know, before 1996, before that legislation was passed, there had never been a U.S. military veteran deported. It goes against who we are as a country. It goes against our fundamental values. So why are we doing that? It's 
a good question. That's all for tonight's show. I invite you to follow me on Facebook at Somos Hispanos and check out previous episodes, articles, and local events that I share throughout the year. Enjoy the holidays. Have a happy new year. For now, I'm Nina Haganis y Somos Hispanos. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.